Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. As we do every week, we have all the best action from all of last Sunday's games to show you. And there were some interesting results in the West last week, Tom. Well, I don't think it was an upset. I thought the Rams were about the most solid team when I saw them on opening day, and they beat San Francisco 40 to 20. I can't believe that any team could score 40 points against that San Francisco defense. That's supposed to be their strong point. I haven't seen the Rams yet. Are they that good? Well, and Hadle doesn't have to throw 26 times a game. He's throwing about 10 or 12, and they're, you know, good play pass action passes. He's super right And now. the two backs, McCutcheon and Bertelson, both have been playing very well. And their offensive line is maybe their real strength, yeah. They're a good team. Did it surprise you that Atlanta lost to Detroit as badly as they did? Boy, I just thought Atlanta looked demoralized, and that is not a Van Brocklin trademark. It looked to me like they lost their cool and their poise. They've got a lot of good personnel. They can't continue to lose like that, I don't think. In the AFC, uh, Denver 14, the Chicago Bears 33. I thought Denver might play the Bears tougher than that. Well, I was surprised the Bears uh, really got on the scoreboard that much. Uh, I knew they were going to fight and beat you up a little bit, but I didn't think the Bears had that much offense. They might surprise a lot of people before it's over with. And Kansas City seems to be back after we buried them a few times. Oakland cannot score a touchdown. I think they've had one touchdown, and that was a punt return this year. Uh, the Raiders are down, but the Kansas City Chiefs are certainly back, right? What about our featured performers of the week, Tom? In the NFC West, our featured performer of the week, number 21, John Hadle. Now the Los Angeles Rams, Pat. He's really having some kind of year. This is from last year when he was still a Charger, but this year he's 28 out of 36 with no interceptions. Main thing is that John has really filled in with a great rushing game that Chuck Knox has, and he doesn't have to throw it as often. He can be more careful. Joe Namath has called him the best passer in the league. Johnny Hadle. In the AFC West, some old friends of John Hadle's, our featured performers of the week, the Kansas City Chiefs defense. And I don't believe they're too old, Pat. A lot of people had said they might be, but against the Raiders last week, they held them to 77 yards on the ground, 72 yards in the air. This is last year's footage when everybody knew they were tough. I think Curly Culp getting back in that lineup uh, makes a difference. He and Buck Buchanan inside are still two tough tackles. And when you back them up with those three linebackers they've got, Willie Lanier in the middle, Bobby Bell, and Jim Lynch on the outside, there's not a better trio in football. They held the Oakland Raiders to no touchdowns. I don't think anybody would have ever realized that. This footage, of course, from last year. It's not whether you're too old, it's whether you're aggressive enough. It looks like the Chiefs are certainly aggressive again. Last week in Cleveland, the Browns and Giants renewed an old rivalry as each team chose a different half of the game in which to play well. Coach Alex Webster of the Giants is a man in charge of an enigma. The Giants were picked to be tough this year, and they have been, but only in the first half. Last week, the pattern once again unfolded. New York dominated the first half as they blew in on Cleveland's Mike Phipps for six sacks and temporarily disabled him. The Giants continued to neutralize the Browns' scoring threat as number 43, Spider Lockhart, came up with an acrobatic theft. When Cleveland did pull off any kind of a decent play, they were severely reprimanded. Cuff on the head left them more than a little groggy and disorganized. Even when they unveiled their new receiver, number 12, Don Cockroft, it turned out that the man with the golden leg had hands of clay. So, bolstered by a Norm Sneed to Bob Tucker 20-yard touchdown strike, the Giants led at the half 10-0. But number 34, Greg Pruitt, gave the Browns some inspiration on a 54-yard kickoff return. Four times Don Cockroft connected to give the Browns a 12 to 10 lead. 
leave their defense protected savagely as Walter Johnson, number 71, was all over Sneed like a big bear on a honey pot. Twice in the waning minutes of play, number 29, Walt Sumner stopped New York's scoring threats with two good interceptions. And once again, the Giants had undergone a second half collapse that left them on the short side of the 12-10 final score. For Cleveland, it was joy unbounded. They had brought their record to two and one, and it was an important win for a team that needed and got some confidence rebuilding after the shellacking they had suffered at the hands of the Pittsburgh Steelers two weeks ago. Well, Pat Cleveland rebounded after some rough treatment by Pittsburgh, and the AFC Central looks like it's going to be something. Nobody knows that better than Paul Brown and his Cincinnati Bengals, and they know that any ground lost in the standings now will be tough to make up later. In San Diego, the Chargers faced the Cincinnati Bengals, and every eye was on the Chargers captain, John Unitas, the storied number 19. For this afternoon, in the 209th game of his 18th season as an NFL quarterback, Johnny U was only two yards short of exceeding 40,000 yards of passing offense in a career, nearly 10,000 more yards than his nearest rivals, Fran Tarkington, Sonny Jurgensen, and John Brody. On the Chargers' second series with third and 14, Unitas looped this pass over linebacker Bill Berge into the hands of Mike Garrett for a 30-yard gain. And John Unitas had exceeded 40,000 yards passing. By game's end, Unitas had completed 15 of 31 for 40,213 yards. And he was working on a record as monumental as Ruth's 714. But this game ball was good enough for the Hall of Fame. For the remainder of the afternoon, the famous quarterback was not treated so reverently by the Cincinnati Bengals. The most effective passing of the game was done by Cincinnati's Ken Anderson, throwing to Essex Johnson, number 19. This 78-yard catch and carry by Johnson gave the Bengals a 7-3 first quarter advantage. In fact, the cat-footed Johnson either set up or scored all of Cincinnati's points. This 20-yard gain early in the second quarter preceded a one-yard score by Booby Clark, but a missed extra point left the score at 13-3 in favor of Cincinnati. In the third quarter, Johnson romped again for 38 yards, bringing his stats for the game to 237 total yards on offense. And that was enough to overcome the Chargers. But late in the game, John Unitas waved his magic arm and showed that some of the old comeback greatness still remained. This 51-yard bomb to Gary Garrison brought the ball to the Bengals' 11-yard line. Three plays later, United speared Bob Thomas in the end zone, giving San Diego a head of steam with a score 20 to 13, and eight and a half minutes left to play. But the Bengals' Booby Clark and Essex Johnson devoured the clock, leaving only 47 seconds for John Unitas to work his magic. And that, even for the old master, was not enough time as the Chargers bowed to the Bengals 20 to 13. While the Pittsburgh Steelers have come into their own as a true power in the National Football League, the Houston Oilers have not. Attempting to break a 13-game losing skid, the Oilers sought the shelter of their own Astrodome in looking for a win. When he has pass protection, Dan Pastorini ranks behind no other quarterback in the league in pure passing ability. But unfortunately for the Houston Oilers, pass protection isn't one of their strong points, especially against Joe Green and the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
However, the Oilers gave the rugged steel gang all they wanted in last Sunday's first half. John Charles' interception of a Terry Bradshaw aerial set up Houston's only score. Pastorini used a play-action pass for the touchdown. Tight end Mac Alston was on the receiving end of the Pastorini spiral, giving Houston a 7-6 halftime lead. But for the second half, the Pittsburgh defense would rule the roost. Houston's hope of a second-half ground attack faded as the steel door snapped shut. While shutting off the running game, number 68, L.C. Greenwood, led the assault on the almost non-existent Houston pass protection. Shaken by the heavy rush, Pastorini missed fire. Andy Russell followed a wave of blockers in for the Pittsburgh touchdown. The steel curtain descended again, this time on Oilers second team quarterback, Lynn Dickey. Glenn Edwards outraced the entire Houston team for an 86-yard touchdown. While the Pittsburgh defense proved too tough to handle, Terry Bradshaw was chipping away at the Oilers' secondary. A Bradshaw sneak, three Roy Jarella field goals, and a touchdown pass to Ronnie Shanklin rounded out the Pittsburgh onslaught. Pittsburgh is now 3-0, while the unfortunate Oilers have dropped to 0-3. Both the New Orleans Saints and the Baltimore Colts are young teams with young quarterbacks. And you know what that means, Tom. It's a good time to be in the secondary. Also means that when both teams meet on the same field, the game does not always resemble pro football. At quarterback for the Colts, number seven, Burt Jones. And starting at quarterback for the Saints, no, the Saints did not trade for one of those paunchy, grizzled veteran quarterbacks you read about who won games throwing wobbly passes or kicking last second field goals. No, it wasn't Al Hurt, the Saints' number one horn blower. Unfortunately for New Orleans, they could have used a veteran quarterback. Al Hurt, maybe, or Hercules Unchained. Facing the Baltimore Colts, New Orleans saw their secondary shredded by Jones, the good old boy from Ruston, Louisiana. Jones passed Baltimore to a touchdown on their first possession with a strike to unattended Tom Mitchell, number 84. Then Jones stayed on the ground using the explosive burst of Don McCauley, number 23, who gained over 100 yards, and former Penn State great Lydell Mitchell, who gained 133. From in close, there was the human bowling ball, Don Nottingham. And in the first quarter, Baltimore led 14-0. However, any further Colt scoring was blunted by interceptions on four consecutive series. This pass was stolen by former Colt Billy Newsom, number 78, who was traded to New Orleans for the rights to Jones. New Orleans' strategy was simple. Let Archie air it out. Although this pass was ruled out of bounds, Archie was just warming up against the once impregnable Baltimore zone defense.
Archie aired it out for over 250 yards, and this rollout rifle shot to Bob Newland for six. But time ran out for Archie and the Saints, and they fell to the Colts 14-10. There's nothing better than opening a brand new multi-million dollar stadium with a victory. And that's what the Buffalo Bills had in mind when they opened Rich Stadium last week against the Joe Namathless Jets. Dwarfed by the dizzying proportions of the Buffalo Bills' new ball yard, the fans came to Rich Stadium for the very first time in the regular season to see their tough enough Bills tangle with Al Woodall and the New York Jets. With a spectacular new showcase for his enormous talent, O.J. Simpson ripped around right end on Buffalo's first possession, setting up a 42-yard field goal by John Leipold. But that was the only score for more than three quarters, as both teams showed an inability to get into the end zone. The Bills, led by number 73, Earl Edwards, featured a rebuilt defense, which harassed Al Woodall and held the Jets at bay. <music> Meanwhile, Buffalo was chewing up more than 200 yards rushing, churning up and down the field, led by O.J. Simpson, flashing the great Jimmy Brown's number 32, and looking for all the pro football world on this afternoon like the immortal Brown's equal. On this, the third NFL Sunday of 73, Simpson exceeded the 100-yard mark for the third time, gaining 123 yards and 24 carries, controlling the ball for Buffalo, protecting their slim lead. The Bills' offensive line is improved, and they may make good their promise of 1,700 yards for O.J. Simpson this season. But when the Bills deviated from their straight-ahead tactics, the Jets closed in, and Buffalo could do no better than three field goals, building a 9-0 advantage. But nine points was good enough, as the defense shut out New York until late in the last quarter, when Al Woodall, subbing for the injured Joe Namath, hit Jerome Barkham on a play that many Jet fans would have rather done without, as Woodall had to be helped from the field after a 9-7 defeat by the Buffalo Bills. And so the Bills are now in first place in the AFC East. And I can assure you, Pat, I never thought I'd be able to say that, at least not this season, huh? They are in first place, Tom, but they are tied for that spot with a team that they and most everybody else has had trouble with the last few years, the world champion Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins were ready to rebound after their loss in Oakland, but the New England Patriots had some surprises ready for Miami, like 5-foot, five 5-inch five Mac Heron, number 42. The Patriots came close to scoring first when Josh Ashton, number 31, broke loose in the Miami secondary. From the four-yard line, vaulting specialist Sam Bam Cunningham let the Dolphins off the hook. After a scoreless first quarter, Eugene Mercury Morris followed number 66 Larry Little, among others, to an easy touchdown. Less than two minutes later, Mighty Mercury took the game into his own hands. Time, Miami led 20 to 3, but Jim Plunkett brought the Patriots back with a pass to Reggie Rucker, number 33. While the New England offense definitely has a new look this season, occasionally it looks a little like last year or the year before. 
because Jim Plunkett still must scramble. And when in trouble, he'll still look for his old Stanford buddy, Randy Rabbit Vataha, number 18. Midway in the third period, John Tarver, number 36, cut over tackle and into the Miami end zone. And while this is indeed a rare sight for Miami watchers, imagine their surprise when moments later, following a Bob Greasy fumble, Tarver again cut into the end zone, this time bringing New England within a touchdown after three quarters. In the fourth period, Jim Plunkett rang up another touchdown with a corner shot to Reggie Rucker. But the young patriots of Chuck Fairbanks are not quite ready to outscore the world champions. For any young team, mistakes of inexperience will usually lead directly to defeat. The Dolphins scored three times in the fourth quarter, once on Nick Bonacani's fumble return, once on a perfect Bob Greasy post pattern to Paul Warfield, and once on another swing down the lane by the 73 model Mercury, on the way to a Miami record of 197 yards rushing, and finally, a convincing victory for the Miami Dolphins. We'll be right back with the second half of this week in pro football following station identification. The Chicago Bears were the guests of the Denver Broncos last weekend, Pat, and the mile-high altitude seemed to make both teams even meaner. <laughs> both Abe Gibran and John Ralston are in their second year, and both of their clubs are really starting to come around. After suffering hard-fought defeats at the hands of top contenders Dallas and Minnesota, Abe Gibron brought his Bears to Denver with an obvious hunger for victory. With Floyd Little responsible for three Denver turnovers, leading to a touchdown and two field goals, the Bears had themselves quite a feast. Only when the shadows in Mile High Stadium were too long to make any difference did Denver score. Once on a one-yard plunge by Bobby Anderson, and on this 36-yard screen pass to former Purdue All-American number 24, Otis Armstrong. But for the greater part of the afternoon, John Ralston's theory of positive thinking withered under the Bears' barrage. The Bears' rushing defense held the Broncos to just 71 yards on the ground. With ground traffic slowed to a halt, Charlie Johnson went to the air 40 times and was intercepted twice. Number 55, Doug Buffone, copped this pass to set up one of two Mac Percival field goals. Third-year veteran number 35, Jim Harrison, paced the Chicago ground attack. He carried 18 times for 98 yards. Bobby Douglas, throwing a surprising 21 times, found Harrison with a step on Bronco safety number 36, Billy Thompson. An easy six points resulted. Capitalizing on one of Floyd Little's fumbles, number 35 got the call again and blasted his 235 pounds into the Bronco goal. Harrison's second touchdown in the Mile High Arena led to a fatigued, high-altitude spike. Throughout the day, Douglas kept the Herald Denver rush on us with passes like this one to safety valve Carl Garrett.
Douglas put another six points on the board with a strike to tight end number 82, Earl Thomas, who coasted in for six points and a long sought 33-14 victory over the Denver Broncos. While the Bears were rolling to their first win of the season, the Green Bay Packers and the unbeaten Minnesota Vikings were slugging it out for the top spot of the NFC Central. While both clubs are known for aggressive, hard-hitting, no-score defensive play, Pat, the failure of both offenses to score a touchdown still has to come as somewhat of a surprise. While the heroics of Jim Del Gazo's performance against the Lions two weeks ago had many Green Bay fans shouting his name, there was to be but one cry echoing across the gridiron of Metropolitan Stadium on this Sunday. Wishing to find out just who Del Watts' name was, the Purple Gang went in for a closer look. It wasn't long until the cry changed to, what is a Del Gazo? The usually consistent Packer ground attack followed Del Gazo's example and fell before the purple people eaters. Scott Hunter replaced Del Gazo and appeared to have the pack on the move. However, an interception by Minnesota's Bob Bryant on the next play killed the drive. For the Viking offense, it was a day of frustration as big gainers did not lead to touchdowns. Ed Marinero's 27-yard sweep set up a second quarter field goal and brought Marinero's mafia to their feet. Fran Tarkenton split the seams of the Packers secondary using his other running back, the versatile rookie from Miami, Chuck Foreman. The leading Viking pass receiver in Russia rolled up well over 100 yards in total offense for the afternoon. For the second week in a row, the scoring punch was provided on three Fred Cox field goals. The defense added a safety for an 11-3 Minnesota win, proving a wise Viking saying. After suffering an upset at the hands of the St. Louis Cardinals, the Washington Redskins arrived in Philadelphia last weekend in a very grim mood. George Allen called closed practice sessions all week following the Redskins' loss to the St. Louis Cardinals. Last Sunday, when the Washington offense took the field against Philadelphia's high-flying Eagles, it was obvious that Billy Kilmer was on the short end of Coach Allen's master plan. It was Christian Nadolf Jurgensen the third at the controls, and from the opening gun, the 39-year-old second stringer started to click. Charlie Taylor was supposed to run a square out, but with no one covering deep, he turned up field and gathered in Jurgensen's pass for first blood. The Eagle defense responded by holding the once vaunted Redskin ground attack to 36 yards in the first half. Roman Gabriel made some believers out of the Washington deep zone defenders when he hit number 36, Norm Bulosh, in full stride at the Redskin 45-yard line. The 80-yard scoring play made for some roughhouse celebration and what looked to be another slugfest in the NFC East. But an aroused Redskin defense at the start of the second half began to smother the Eagles' hope of victory. Eight times Roman Gabriel fell victim to the pincher-like Washington rush. Unscathed, Sonny started the second half off with a quick strike to number 88, Alvin Reed, for a first down deep in Birdland. 
Hole number nine showed he still had his fastball when he split three Eagle defenders to find Charlie Taylor for six. Taylor's self-acknowledgement was rudely interrupted by number 28, Bill Bradley, but just momentarily. Protecting a seven-point lead, the Skins defense came up with some terrifying hits. Roman Gabriel's intended pass to Tom Sullivan was picked off by number 55, Chris Hanberger, and returned 45 yards to the Eagle 19. From there, it was a one-man show as Larry Brown carried six straight times before he scored from the one. With a three-game total of only 130 yards and 56 carries, the pounding of his fifth NFL season seems to be taking an early toll. Behind 21-7 with only seconds on the clock, Cornerback Ted Bachter made a break on Gabriel's pass and returned it 34 yards for the score. For the Skins and Sonny Jurgensen, it was a sweet vindication for the previous week's loss. For Mike McCormick and company, a measure of how far the Eagles have yet to go. Well, Pat, it looks like another summit meeting between the Redskins and the Cowboys. Besides the return of Roger Staubach to his Super Bowl form, about the only new face on offense for Dallas is Billy Joe Dupree. Cowboys rookie tight end who wrecked the Cardinals' hopes for their third straight victory. At Texas Stadium, the unbeaten and underdog St. Louis Cardinals face the undefeated Dallas Cowboys. Under Don Coryell, the Cardinals have become a wide-open, explosive, offensive team. They have a strong-arm quarterback in Jim Hart and two quicksilver receivers in Mel Gray, number 85, and rookie running back Terry Metcalf, number 21. However, against the Doomsday defense, St. Louis scored but one touchdown. It came in the last quarter when number 27, Eddie Moss, carried out a beautiful fake, and Donnie Anderson powered over for his seventh touchdown of the young season. For most of the day, Dallas completely disrupted the big red attack. They held St. Louis to 51 yards rushing, and led by the outside charge of Larry Cole, number 63, they collapsed the Cardinal pass pocket. Twice, Doomsday intercepted Jim Hart. Here, a blitz by number 50, D.D. Lewis, and fine outside coverage of 84, Walker Gillette, resulted in a Cliff Harris interception. On offense, Roger Staubach was superb, and Bob Hayes was a blur in the Cardinal secondary. Misdirection by the Cowboys had the Cardinals flowing one way, and Roger threw back against the grain for a touchdown to Billy Joe Dupree. The second touchdown resulted from letter-perfect execution of the sweep by the offensive line and set back Calvin Hill. All day, Staubach lured the defense in, then deftly dumped the ball to chunky Robert Newhouse. At the end of the third quarter, Staubach on a rollout connected with Dupree again, and Dallas had 31 points. When Staubach rested, the Dallas machine purred along smoothly as Craig Morton hit rookie Golden Richards dead in stride with a 53-yard touchdown. By days in, the Cowboys amassed almost 600 yards on offense, scored six touchdowns, three by Billy Joe Dupree, 
and earned a convincing 45-10 victory over the Cardinals. Last week in Kansas City, the Chiefs took on the Oakland Raiders in the 29th renewal of one of pro football's hottest rivalries. Going into last week's game, the series was absolutely even. 13 wins for Kansas City, 13 for Oakland, and two ties. Before last week's meeting with Oakland, most of the so-called experts had already buried the Kansas City Chiefs. They hadn't been able to stop the Rams in the opener. They hadn't been able to score more than one touchdown against the Patriots in week two. They were, as the experts said, too old, too ready to look for a place to lie down. And if any team could put them out of their misery quickly, it would be the arch rival Raiders from Oakland. Clarence Davis covered 76 yards in one bolt, but this was to be the only long play of the game. The rest of the day belonged entirely to the men of the defense, particularly to the much maligned men of the Kansas City defense. They were ready for the men in silver and black and especially ready for the ultimate quarry, quarterback Darrell LaMonica. For the most part, LaMonica's strategy was to hand off to his runners like Marv Hubbard, number 44. The Raiders ran 25 times, but gained only 77 yards. And sometimes, even an attempted handoff got LaMonica into hot water with the Chiefs' front four. Through three quarters of the game, LaMonica hung in and took his punishment from the inspired Kansas City rush line. In the fourth quarter, lefty Ken Stabler was called to the rescue, but it was all the same to the Chiefs' defense. Lynn Dawson did not have things much easier on the Chiefs' side. Tough as it was, six times Dawson got the Chiefs close enough for Jan Stinnerud to attempt a field goal. Once he was short, twice he was blocked, but three of his kicks were converted into nine points for the Chiefs. Trailing by six with two minutes to play, Ken Staber dropped back and passed short to Pete Banizak. The ball was deflected and Willie Lanier gratefully returned the gift for the clinching score. Perhaps a fitting conclusion to a game in which neither team could put across an offensive touchdown. In fact, the Raiders' offense has yet to score its first touchdown of the season. As Raider coach John Madden stated after the game, I've heard the Chiefs were on the way down, but that's not true. They're number one now. Hank Stram and the Chiefs will settle for that any day. In the NFC West, the Los Angeles Rams have put together quite a team. They've surprised a lot of people, and they seem to look better every week, Tom. You're right, Pat, and quarterback Johnny Hadel seems to be the catalyst that's caused things to gel. He's throwing less than he ever has, but he's really picking his spots very effectively. Quarterback John Hadel has found a happy home with the Los Angeles Rams and says he hasn't enjoyed football so much in a long, long time. And why shouldn't he? Already Ram fans are beginning to smell playoff money. And if the first three weeks of the season are an indication, their collective sense of smell could be correct. Their two main rivals in the NFC West figured to be the Falcons and the 49ers. Two weeks ago, they disposed of Atlanta by the lopsided score of 31-0. Last week, it was San Francisco's turn. Admittedly, the Rams got off to a poor start. A bobbled punt gave the 49ers good field position. Mm -hmm. 
John Brody to Gene Washington put them on the one from where Vic Washington made Gene's touchdown signal correct. But the San Francisco lead was short-lived as number 32, Cullen Bryant, took the next kickoff and raced 93 yards to put Los Angeles on top 10-7. John Brody rallied his forces, and using number 22, Vic Washington, as his main man, he drove for the tying field goal. Not being what you'd call a power running back, Vic Washington spent much of the afternoon trying to hurdle and high step away from the strong Ram defense. With the score tied at 10, John Hadle went into top gear. He mixed his plays carefully, hitting on eight of 11 passes. At the 11-yard line, he handed off to number 30, Lawrence McCutcheon, who went right up the middle and almost took the goal post with him. Behind virtually perfect protection, Hadle then hit streaking Harold Jackson, and L.A. led 24-10. John Brody was harassed most of the afternoon as Fred Dreyer got a hand on this one. Brody's portrait of a man disgusted was good, but nothing compared to Vic Washington's after he blew an easy one. And Vic's portrait of disgust was nothing compared to the 49er coach Dick Nolans, who saw his team come up to the big one, only to end up with a case of throat trouble. The Rams ended the afternoon with their running game as Tony Baker, number 35, bulldozed his way for 17 yards to the one. From there, the ex-Saint, ex-Eagle, dove over and disappeared to make the score 40 to 13. Hoping to keep it respectable, the 49ers' Steve Spurrier hit Ted Qualick late in the game to make the final Los Angeles 40, San Francisco 20. For Chuck Knox and his undefeated Rams, it was a time to smile, for the victory made it six wins in their last six games with the 49ers, and gave them a two-game lead in the NFC West. Well, what about our picks for the week, Pat? You really blitzed me last week. I was long overdue. I was five and two last week, and you were two and five. That makes me eight and six over you on the year. But you got plenty of chances to get even. Now, San Francisco at Atlanta, what do you think? Gosh, it's a hard one to pick. I think we picked them maybe to win the division when we started out. I think you're right. I'm going to go with San Francisco. Well, they're certainly overdue. Uh, Atlanta looked uh, demoralized against Detroit uh, the other night up in Tiger Stadium. I got to agree with you. I, I can't believe that San Francisco's personnel is going to allow this to continue to happen. How about Denver at Kansas City? That should be a real brawl. I think playing in Kansas City will hurt the Broncos, and it looks like Dawson is back to lead that offense. I'm going to go with the Kansas City Chiefs to beat Denver. God, I agree with you. I'll go with the Chiefs, too. Oakland at St. Louis, what do you think? Oh, the Raiders haven't scored much, but I think they're going to beat the St. Louis Cardinals. I don't know how many points it's going to take. They just really haven't been able to generate any offense, and that's sort of strange because their personnel is so good. You'd think that Super. they'd be able to put a lot of points on the board, wouldn't you? What are you going to do? I'm going to go with Oakland. Oakland. Okay, we're all together. All right, Tom. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. I'm Tom Brookshire. We'll see you next week. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by West Clocks. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. There are over 1,250 Best Western Motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines, if the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life.
Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.